I, I kind of wanted to ask, guys, but wanted to ask a question uh, back to what Ted brought up in, at the beginning about the to go me uh, in the park experience. I'm, I'm interested in what the rest of you think actually happened then. It's like what factually happened if there were if you can say such a thing about this novel. <laughs> Oh, Bill loved the character, <clears throat> Mr. Tagomi, who begins to see what's wrong with the traditions and customs that he grew up in. But even though Tagomi gets a glimpse of another world, it isn't our world either. It, it's yet another layer of multiple realities. And I think Bill wanted to suggest that we choose our reality. That unlike the Adjustment Bureau where a team goes in and actually he called it the Adjustment Team. The team goes in and changes everything. You're changing your own world and Some fool's phoning me. I'm ignoring it. <laughs> when you have something like the Mandela effect, you don't have, nobody has to change history. All they have to change is the history books. And if you read them over time, you get an 1800 history book, and then one from the 1900s, and then one, one from our time. They all have different stories about the same people and events. So yeah, there are multiple realities, but they might just be because we write our histories from different perspectives. Well, there's a line, it might be from John Clute's saying that the science fiction is not about the future, it's about now. I think the same is true about history books, that inevitably you write the history book from the perspective of, of now and what you choose to, to promote or downplay. Uh, so I can remember when I was doing A-level, uh, I went to a, the 18-year-old qualification that you get in, in England and Wales. Uh, and I went to a, a day seminar on the English Reformation and one professor gave a long talk about how actually the English Reformation was a huge success and everyone was Protestant and, and the rest of it. Uh, and they won, as it were, and then someone gave a paper saying it was a complete disaster and there was lip service to Protestant, but most people actually didn't give a, a damn about the religion, but there were a whole lot more Catholics around them, etc. So we've given these, these two narratives about history which couldn't be recon reconciled. Um, but I think the, the, the importance of, of science fiction is to show us that the world could be different from what it is. Uh, and so what, what we have in, in that final sequence, among other things, is to go and be suddenly being subject to the, the kind of racism that the Jewish characters are within the novel are and so forth. So it's, it's again, it, it's, um, that kind of the answer to the to the the, the other chain of that you know is, is this novel true? Uh, again, again, it kind of uh, it depends what you mean by truth, doesn't it? That it's, it's got truths. Uh, so I mean, obviously, um, somebody mentioned Alberto Rossi earlier. Uh, he, he talks about these um, primary, secondary, and tertiary worlds. That we've got the real world, and then we've got the fictional world, and within that world there's further fiction, etc. And he presents it almost as a, as a, a level of strata. Um, as if we can tunnel down to the, the ultimate truth. Um, but the fascinating thing about this novel, among many others by Dick, is the way in which it unsettles our sense of what's real uh, to the point of view when that 
that stops being useful concept and it's, it's how people behave with each other it's, becomes the significant thing. Um, uh, on to Gomi, of course, he, he is the figure that Ursula Le Guin, who was at high school overlapping with Dick uh, in the late 40s, uh, Ursula Le Guin wrote an uh, article called Science Fiction and Mrs. Brown, uh, which jumps off an old lit crick article about Mr. Bennett and Mr. Brown, Brown uh, which is a debate about who was better, H.G. Wells or Arnold Bennett. But Le Guin says that Tagomi is the one real character in science fiction, or something like that, or, or is the, an early example of a real character in science fiction that's got three dimensional depth in the rest of it. I mean, I, I, I slightly worry how much there's that, that term orient, orientalism mm -hmm. uh, coined by Edward Said, uh, where elsewhere and the East has moved over the years. Uh, it was Egypt, it's, it's different parts of the, the, the Middle East or the Far East. Uh, that kind of fetishization that we get of Japanese culture. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's dated as, um, as well as it might do. I think that maybe a certain amount of stereotyping in the presenting to Gomi and Paul and Betty among other characters. Yeah, I, I, I think his characterization of uh, the Japanese culture was very much influenced by sort of the, the influence of some of these ideas in some of the, the Eastern influence into kind of the beatnik culture, and aside from from this, there were there were some vague ideas. I don't think he really knew much uh, in comparison to what we call Asian culture now, and specifically Japanese culture. I don't I don't think there's that much reflected in in this book, uh, and I'm, that's not to discredit him. It's just he didn't have the sources. Uh, and I think it's fairly superficial things like here's some of the poetry and Juliana's doing judo. That was, if you go back to that time period, I, when I grew up, I happened to watch a lot of the Flintstones. The Flintstones debuted in 1960. One of the early episodes, the, the wives in the, the show, they go off and take judo lessons. And there's this very, very what we'd say racist uh, caricature of a judo instructor. That, that's kind of the level that a, a fair amount of that, I think, is in the book. Nice sense of black belt. Can, can I come on to also real quick, Frank? Just, let me just step in. I just want to say that you talk about three stories. Oh, oh, hold on a second. Phil knew Japanese neighbors who had been interned in the war. That's where he got a great deal of it. Second, yeah, Phil's son, Christopher, has black belts in judo and other things that I can neither spell nor pronounce. But he taught me to count to ten in Japanese. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't dispute any of that. I just think he's, in the book, he's trying to present characters who are actually you know, the, the Japanese coming here. I, I think the Kasoris were more of a reflection of, of thinking about uh, Americans in a similar situation. Going to Japan, kind of being like hobbyists, like like going in and, uh, well, that's another, another, another thing I can pull out. Here's, here's that actual uh, sinking of the Panay card. So, he presents Japanese characters coming here and, and, and saying, these are really interesting objects, I'm going to collect them, but not understand this. The, the, the Battle of Panay, how? USS, USS Panay sinks as crew abandoned the ship. This is an example of the actual card. Or at least, if you know, maybe it's an artificial. But it, it would be as if, uh, in that same period, the, the uh, young U.S. professionals went to Japan, helped the development, 
we're, we're businessmen and we're going on and, and, and collecting samurai swords or something like that and not really having any serious understanding of the samurai here and things like that. Well, I think most sort of the kasuras uh, in, in their interaction with all the children, uh, I think they put them in there because he wanted to demonstrate the fact the, the relation between the subject, race, uh, uh, Robert Chilvan, an American, because it was Japanese. I think uh, they put the Kurosawa's in there to, to highlight the relationship between the dominant Japanese and the submissive Americans, to, which, which underlies the whole thrust of the, the, the racism angle in the book. So the Kurosawa's were invented, invented for the necessity to get to that point of the, the relations between the, uh, uh, the, 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 the white people and, and the Japanese. If, uh, if that, if I'm, I'm still thinking about all this. I'm thinking it all out, but I'm, I'm trying to look it out of my head. So I think, you know, you, you know how it is when you're a writer, you, you make stuff up on the spot. Well, I need this. You make it up, and there it is, and it's in a narrative. So I think he's, he's trying to conserve us through the whole, the whole novel like that, but it was always about Robert Childan worrying about losing face, doing the right thing, becoming, you know, Becoming Japanese, you know. Uh, that's my two tenses. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I'd like to expand for just a moment. Um, I think that Frank has touched on a good insight about the beatnik connection, right? And um, uh, you know, recently when Eric Davis uh, spoke about his new book uh, that that analyzes Philbin, that sprung from a religious studies dissertation, he mentioned uh, Dick's relationship with the poet Jack Spicer. Um, which I think is important. And um, another character that I might uh, mention, another Philip K. Dick character, right, is um, Alan Watts, who, uh, you know, I think is a, is a great place to look in terms of what people in the beatnik countercultural sensibility sort of wanted to get from uh, Eastern religion, right? You know, they, they saw these problems, you know, just like Tagomi, right, saw the problems with his inherited tradition. Uh, you know, the beatniks, had a story about the problems with American culture, had a story about, you know, what the Orient had to offer. Um, so we might, you know, look to a book like Alan Watts' Way of Zen, um, which is really Alan Watts channeling D.T. Suzuki, right? And D.T. Suzuki, who, was he uh, on, on Dick's book reading list? Um, you know, he was really trying to translate um, Zen Buddhism into the sensibilities of the Eranos school of comparative religion, right? So we have a, a, you know, a few different levels of interpretation going on here, um, you know, where the, you know, the kind of like, you know, Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell, Mercha Eliad uh, school of comparative religion, um, D.T. Suzuki was, was kind of part of that crowd, you know, he parted with them, he went to their conferences and all that, so, uh, you know, he was really pitching Zen Buddhism to that sensibility, and then Alan Watts went on to uh, popularize it in the West. Uh, I'm not sure when the way of Zen came out, but I think that was before. Yeah, is it was Zen, that later? Yeah, Zen in the Zap Japanese culture, 1959 is one of the books. So yeah, Suzuki was Suzuki. Yeah, yeah was series. in the acknowledgement. So I mean, so Dick did, did have access to a Japanese scholar of of you know the Buddhist religion. Um, you know, it's not as if he's completely disconnected, you know, it's not as if he's just making it up out of whole cloth. Um, but we have to understand this, this kind of lineage of, of interpretation. We have to understand the interpretive community, and I think looking to the beatniks is, is a great place to go. And that segues into um, my last question that I'd like to have all of our members um, address, and then I'll open it up to questions, because I'm sure you have a few burning questions after all of these tantalizing uh, tidbits we've dropped in front of you, and that is, uh, you know, what, what is the future of Man in the High Castle studies? Um, you know, where are we going with this? Uh, you know, I've mentioned um, my work uh, hanging out with Bronnie and Davis, you know, I'm very curious about the, the I Ching, you know, what we can kind of turn up from, uh, from her correspondence with Phil that might help us with the interpretation of the I Ching. And um, I'd also like to hear an answer to the Avram Davidson question, right? Is, uh, is the I Ching really, uh, really the, the protagonist of the novel, right? Ursula Le Guin has this powerful take on Tagomi that, you know, he's one of the first great, you know, fully realized uh, literary characters in science fiction. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious to know where 
you know, where these, you know, the Davidson and Le Guin theses, um, where they're going to go in the future of Philip K. Dick interpretation. So let's uh, let's hand the mic over to Andrew and let's have each of our uh, panelists give a, a, a thought about the future of uh, the Man in the High Castle interpretation. Okay, that's a big question again. Mine goes blank. Uh, I fear uh, it will be dominated by people writing about the TV series. Uh, I, I think that will be where the centre of gravity goes. Having only seen the first episode, I can't dismiss it as rubbish. Um, right, but, but uh, I, I, I don't, don't I mean, friends of mine really like it. Uh, they're not necessarily people who would read science fiction though, so, but uh, it's clearly a, a, a popular text. It's gone up to three seasons, uh, so I think that that will be where things go. Um, as a, I'm not sure where the literary stuff is it will go. I mean, there, there are clearly a whole lot of little details uh, that can be picked out. I've forgotten about the the. Um, the Japanese neighbours, the fact that he, he's drawing on. Uh, there's obviously a whole cluster of references of Man the High Castle is one of the half a dozen to ten books that Dick returns to again and again, trying to explain the pink light experience. Uh, I don't know whether anybody's kind of gone through the published sections of the exegesis uh, to, to um, organise what he says, how he, he contradicts himself, etc. Um, it's a lot of small things. Yeah. I've never really read like an essay on it, and it doesn't loom as large as books like Ubik or Maze of Death. Right. And so, you know, somebody's going to have to do the work of knitting together a whole lot of small statements, putting those all in the context of when he was writing, you know, which folder does it fall into, um, you know, which uh, which vision is he interpreting and all that. So there's a whole lot of work left to be done. And if anybody's interested in the exegesis, and, uh, the man in the high castle is a great topic. I mean, that, that feels like it would be a job for those people who do. There's a group of people, people doing corpus work on Shakespeare using computers, um, the context of which character says we most, which character says we love most and then turning up that into criticism. This feels like it, it's a, a big data research project uh, rather than a kind of read it fast and tell a story about it research. What was the question? Uh, so the question is what's what's the future of, um, of Philip Kendrick's studies and, and also what do you think about Avram Davidson's idea that the I Ching is the, the real protagonist of a novel? Oh, okay. I think the I Ching is the co-author. Phil wanted the protagonist to be Frank, Frank, but I think Juliana kind of takes the spotlight away from him. Interestingly, he, he based the rumors about Robinson on the rumors that Robert Heinlein lived in a fortress. Well, when I had the opportunity to visit the high lines. They really had a concrete wall surrounding their property with uh, spikes of wrought iron above it and, uh, you know, a little electrical thingies. And a gate, uh, an iron gate, and you press the button on the intercom and they decide whether to let you in. And, and they bragged that they didn't even let the IRS come in without an appointment. So it was true. But then, of course, in the novel, Robinson's just some guy. I really hope the TV series goes away, or at least loses its connection to Phil's novel. I, I watched as much as I could, but the brutality is so overwhelmingly in your face. It's gratuitous violence. 
And it's fundamentally wrong to attract the ball. You, you can um, convey the idea that they're torturing people without showing every little bit of what they do to them. I guess Electric Dreams is a little better as an adaptation, but I, I try to avoid such things. You mentioned the adjustment team earlier. Yeah. Uh, and that's a case of a film that I think <coughs> completely misreads material. Oh yeah, adjustment that, heroes. That, yeah. That, if, is there a novel by Dick where the universe is changed so that the main character can live up there for <laughs> It's a short story where the dog forgets to bark so the guy gets to work on time and finds this team adjusting every little bit of the office. And no, they don't live happily ever after in a Philip K. Dick novel. <laughs> Paycheck is even worse, but I like Screamers. Second Variety. I love Radio Free Album with. And, you know, the other side. Oh, and as far as the novels go, I just can't stand Ballas. It, it hits on too many emotional hot spots for me. And besides, it was a rewrite of Radio Free Alba Month, both of which his agent and editor turned down as unpublishable. Nobody would buy this garbage in the 1970s. So once Blade Runner was optioned and it became obvious they were really making the film, Phil could copy the yellow pages from the phone book and sell that if he wanted to. They, they wanted anything with his name on it. Well, here we go. Okay, just, just a quick uh, follow-up on the Heinlein housing situation. That's true, what you said, Tessa, but that was after Stranger in Strange Land was published. And then after that, he became this uh, popular figure somewhat in the hippie community. So oh, yeah. Heinlein, who was very much a, a hard right, cold warrior during that whole period, he didn't want these hippie types seeking him out. So when he moved to California, yes, he, he tried to keep random people from showing up at his doorstep. He designed his own house. Yes. Heinlein designed his own house. I remember him complaining he had to cut back on the number of electrical outlets because the, each one required its own permit from the county. <laughs> but he did live in a little slice of heaven called Half Moon Bay. Oh, yeah. yeah but have you ever tried to read any of his stories today? Oh, uh, well. I like Heinlein's novel, Double Star. If you read it carefully, the President of the United States is African American, and he never says so. He just describes what he looks like and moves on. Love that novel, and it's a minor novel. And it's other one um, with the cat, the door into summer is a little treasure. But I can't read his time enough for love. I can't even read Stranger in a Strange Land. It's like maybe Heinlein was on LSD. <laughs> yeah, so just quickly back on uh, um, Man the High Castle, Future of That. I, I tend to agree that, it, that the, the video series has poisoned the well, and that's probably the future. But the, the one thing Man the High Castle has going for it, uh, to study it as literature, is that it's first just very good, but also it, it stands alone in, in, his, his, in his work. So it's, it's easy for the, the kind of group think about what to look at to just say, okay, well, if we all look at this, then we're not going to get diverted in, into someone saying, oh, well, you, you, you suddenly think, um, uh, let's see, March of Time Slip is really important.
But if you read that, you've got to read these five others, because they all have these similar elements. <laughs> with, with this, he didn't write anything else in, in any major sense that I think is, is really comparable. So I, I think that's the one thing that's going for it. Uh, the other, other question was about the Yi Jing. I, I actually think the Yi Jing is, is uh, I, I, I went into reading the, this time thinking, well, I'm just going to believe that Yi Jing is the animating force in this novel. Because not only did he write it with some help from it, but the characters believe it. But I, I, it was very striking to me in reading it this time that the Yi Jing was failing them. I mean, Tagomi's whole experience was he had these traumatic events and the Yi Jing didn't have any answers for him. He went into the park looking for a, a conversion experience. I don't think he actually got it. I don't think he went to another world. I think it's described as self-hypnosis, just like in Time Out of Joint, which had similar kind of things. So I, I take a very, what, what I call the, the minimum hypothesis on this which is what Bill Dick apparently told his friends in discussing the Valis experience. He was self-aware about, well, maybe this is all just, you know, some self-delusion or, or much less than I think it is. I, I, I think there's a lot of that in this book where he's writing about his own experiences using the Yi Jing and it's failing him. It, and it, and the, the Abinson, the character, it, it's, there's a little bit of that in there, that he's presented as a character, as an author who had used it and is frightened of it, but he also doesn't believe it. He realized he's self-aware about it might not work. And uh, I, and so I, 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 view, I view it the whole thing that way, as, as it's, it's, it's obviously a major force in, in Dick's life. The, this thing I brought in, has anybody seen this? This is called The Archive of Philip K. Dick. It's, it's a printed catalog. It's not a catalog, but it looks like a catalog from Christie's. A very highfalutin art, art auction house. And what this actually is, it specifically says in there, this is not a catalog, there's nothing for sale in here. Um, around the time of the exegesis coming out, the the state had reacquired the, the manuscripts from Cal State Fullerton and added together all the other stuff that they have. And I think they were using Christie's to try to curate a sale. It's the best I can determine. But anyway, this is the mother load. And uh, in here is a photo of, of the uh, of uh, his readings from the Yijing, and it describes having hundreds of pages of his consulting Yijing in the period 1972 to 1974. So it, it was a real thing in his life, but he didn't always believe it. Very cool. Um, Andrew, Yijing protagonist, yes or no? No. All right. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have to take five. Um, I guess, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to have.